Yes, thanks. Perfect. Okay, so hello everyone uh, from back in Ethiopia and from the US. Thank you for joining us again for the last presentation and then uh, hopefully in the remaining time, um, a panel discussion about the colorectal uh, pathologies that have been discussed over the past two weeks. Uh, today, our presenter is Dr. Mansour Osman from uh, Gondar University. He is an associate professor of surgery uh, at the University in Gondar and a well-known educator. Um, he is uh, going to talk to us about the colon cancer principles for surgical resection. And, um, and Dr. Mansour, this is, uh, the floor is yours. Please go ahead and with your presentation. And thank you for agreeing to do this with us. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nagarma, for uh, giving me this opportunity to present this topic. And I'll be presenting on uh, mainly the principles of uh, surgical rejection for colon cancer. I'm sorry that I could not make um, a wider presentation due to the short of time we have, but uh, I believe our residents will uh, benefit from this presentation and uh, from the uh, upcoming discussion. So this is, as you see, my topic of presentation will be colon cancer, the principles of surgical uh, rejection. This is the front view of um, an outpatient department, outpatient complex in the new referral hospital in Gondar. But um, there will be our part on the left side. So this will be my outline. I will give um, a brief introduction, followed by the general aspects of um, principles of rejection in colon cancer and um, specific um, steps and procedures for colectomies, um, dry colectomy and direct colectomy. And finally, a brief um, discussion. We'll talk briefly on emergency cases on um, colon cancer. The main objectives, the objectives of this presentation should be to understand the general principles of oncologic rejection and technical maneuvers while doing um, colectomies for um, 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 oncologic rejection of colon cancer, and also understanding um, on managing um, emergency cases of colon cancer. So as an introduction, we all know, we all understand that colon cancer is um, one of the um, common malignancies worldwide. It is, uh, of course, the commonest malignancy in the GI. And um, in um, uh, the past decades, past years, then, uh, there have been um, a shift in epidemiology Earlier, it was um, reported, it was believed to be um, existing in low um, incidence in developing countries, in developing na nations, while it was considered to be um, a disease of the Western world. Uh, but nowadays, um, it has been reported that there is a shift in epidemiology with um, a decrease in the developed nations and um, an increase in the developing um, world. There are Many explanations, many hypotheses um, for this, um, um, which include the early diagnosis, early um, 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 detection of colon cancers in the Western world, and also our change in culture, dietary habit, and other related factors predisposing uh, people to developing colon cancer in um, developing nations. Uh, the most important aspect, the change, the shift that is being observed is there is a shift in age from older age to a younger age that is um, commonly seen in um, um, most of the um, developing um, countries. This slide will show you the 2018 figure of um, Ethiopia in our setup and um, it has demonstrated colon cancer to be um, the sort of the malignancy is following breast and cervix um, 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 in all cases, in all sexes, and um, in all ages. Um, other um, institutional studies done in Tukurambasa by Bantalem Chalai um, have demonstrated in a study of um, 621 cases, cancer registries, they have demonstrated um, 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 more than 50%, 56.4% 6 of colon cancer with a mean age of um, um, 46.9 of this range. And they have detected about 40% of their cases to be um, of less than years of age. 
And um, the worst thing is they have seen 65.7 um, of the cases to be diagnosed at um, a later age. Similar studies um, um, were reported by Mohammed Abu Samad in the same institution with uh, almost similar findings. Um, majority of them were, of course, confined to rectal cancer, but the interesting aspect would be they have seen um, certain percent of their kids to be um, of age 30 years and um, younger. And the uh, majority of, the, um, um, of their cases have been diagnosed at um, a distant um, uh, metastasis or locally advanced um, 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 stage. So this is uh, the situation, the reports um, in um, um, some um, parts of our country. We can understand the limitation of these studies because it is um, a single institutional study and uh, the reports come from a single registry in Addis Ababa. But um, our um, unreported um, um, data, the communications we have and the observation are also consistent with this. We see an increasing number of cases colon cancer, rectal cancer in Ethiopia, and most of the patients presenting at a late stage and um, in the younger age group. So um, if this is the case, we have to face what is going on, what is going um, now to come. And as a general surgeon, our residents have to be prepared. They are expected to deal with um, proper management, proper um, the treatment of these um, cases. So. Just saying this much about uh, the introductory part, I will come to the general aspects of um, managing a patient with um, colon cancer. We understand that um, as a general surgeon and as part of the general management of uh, treating a patient with um, colon cancer, the main treatment modality, the mainstay of treating a patient with colon cancer remains to be surgical resection. Surgery is the mainstay of treatment. Um, surgery can be done in different modalities, and um, laparoscopy is um, nowadays um, accepted modality of treatment, and uh, it has become the standard um, approach, the standard modality to treat patients with um, colon cancer and um, um, rejecting the tumor. Uh, this has been proved by many ongoing trials and um, systematic reviews that um, the, the short benefit of laparoscopy has been proved and um, it has an equivalent long-term outcomes as well, which is well established. And um, studies and um, analysis trials by including the color classic and um, cost trials and um, ongoing um, um, analysis, systematic analysis have shown that there is an overall survival and uh, the disease-free five-year survival of colon cancer resection, which is laparoscopic and the standard open resection have almost um, a similar um, um, outcome. Uh, the other option is a um, uh, um, robotic platform, which has um, come to um, existence in the recent years. And with this new dimension, um, the resection of um, um, colon cancer has added another option of treatment, another option of re rejection. A robotic surgery, it has um, many benefits, many advantages, as it was um, demonstrated earlier. And because of its flexibility, its um, the benefit is um, being um, um, justified. And um, well, these are um, fancy equipments, advanced equipments, and um, advanced technologies that um, um, most of us haven't seen. I have had a chance to see a robotic procedure being done in Sweden, but um, 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 I am sure that most of our colleagues haven't seen these procedures. So these are fancy technologies. What do we have in hand? We cannot offer this. At this time, what we can offer is conventional open um, um, colectomy. So this is the only option we can offer to our patients at this time. And um, that is the reason why we have to um, um, be familiar with the open colectomies, open rejections of um, 
colon cancer to properly uh, manage our patients. So whatever technique is employed, be it laparoscopic or robotic or open surgery, uh, there are certain objectives. The principles of objectives are that it is mandatory that we achieve a proper oncologic reduction. This is the number one principle. Whatever technique we use, we have to achieve a proper oncologic reduction of um, colonic cancer. Um, what do we mean by this proper oncologic reduction? There are components of this, and um, the tumor uh, component, the tumor containing segment must be removed, must be excised, and it should be excised, not um, a segment of the tumor containing um, of the colon alone, but we must have a free margin, adequate free margin, and all the lymph nodes during this mesentery and uh, draining the site of the tumor, and together with um, mesentery draining and the lymph nodes draining this uh, part of the colon will have to go um, in block. This is one major objective that we have to achieve, whatever technique we use. The second major objective that we have to um, achieve is um, fashioning a safe colostomy. Uh, sorry, safe um, anastomosis after um, uh, resecting this uh, um, uh, colon cancer. So there are key components, key important points that we have to stress every time, as it is always remembered um, every now and then. Um, anastomosis has to be fashioned in a way that it should be airtight and it should be attention free, and it has to be a well vascularized. And um, one thing that we have to stress again is that we have to keep the alignment of the bowel. Alignment of the bowel should be um, 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 in the normal orientation to avoid um, unwanted complications later on. Uh, these are the key points that we have always to remember while um, uh, making the anastomosis. The other issue regarding oncologic resection is um, issue of um, extent of resection. Of course, the um, extent of resection will be depending on the location of the tumor, but we must have clear proximal and distal margin, as it is mentioned. Here we have um, a 10 centimeter proximal, five centimeter distal is um, something that we can achieve. Five centimeter proximal distal is also possible. And um, uh, this is a liberal as compared to the rectal Rejections, as um, you can remember in the earlier presentation. But um, as long as we have um, um, ligated, um, depending on the vascular requirement, we always have um, a length that we can spare, that we can reject, and rejection of um, a longer segment of the colon is not a problem in case of colonic rejection as compared to um, rectal um, surgery. The other principle as part of the excision that we have to keep is ligation and division of um, the proximal and the distal vessels. The feeding vessels, at least one proximal and one distal uh, feeding vessel should be ligated and divide feeding the artery, uh, the tumor, sorry. So these are the main principles and um, objectives that we have to achieve while doing um, rejection. So, in the extent of rejection will be visible here. Uh, as I have mentioned, the extent of rejection will depend mainly on the location of the tumor. For tumors located in the cecum and um, in the ascending colon, we have um, the right hemicolectomy respecting the blood supply. And um, this is the extent of the tumor for tumors uh, rejection for tumors located in the cecum and the ascending colon. If a tumor is located more proximally around the hepatic flexure, uh, we can do right hemicolectomy if it is away 10 centimeters, less than 10 centimeters in distance from the right branch of the middle colic. Um, and um, for tumors located in um, um, uh, closer to uh, the closer than 10 centimeters distance, we have to make it um, um, an extended procedure. So uh, D will demonstrate this condition, a tumor located in the transverse colon 
um, we have two options if it is located in the transverse colon. We can do transverse colectomy, respecting the um, uh, principles of ligating the feeding vessels, as I've mentioned, proximal and distal, or we can do a formal hemicolectomy, extended right hemicolectomy. For tumors located in the splenic flexure, again, we have two possibilities like this one. If the tumor is located just at the splenic flexure, we can do um, excision, removal of this resection of the splenic flexure area, again, respecting um, um, proximal and distal um, vascular ligation. Or we have another option to do um, a formal left hemicolectomy. For tumors in the sigmoid, then we can do um, uh, sigmoidectomy and descending colon tumors must have um, uh, a left um, colectomy done. So um, these are the general principles, the general um, guides that we have to follow. And now I will come to the um, specific technical procedures, the steps that we follow in terms of technique while doing uh, right colectomy and left hemicolectomy for um, um, colon cancer. Um, with um, all the preoperative preparation, preoperative evaluation, staging, all completed, we come with um, the patient in superimposition in the operating theater, and um, we make a vertical incision, which usually extends proximal to the umbilicus and distal to the umbilicus, depending on the extent, which is um, possible to um, make um, 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 more um, um, if, we, if there is a need to extend. And following a midline incision, um, we have to expose the um, abdomen. And uh, for a better exposure of the abdomen, we use some um, self-retaining retractors. Next to this, we have to thoroughly examine the abdominal cavity. A thorough examination of the abdominal cavity is mandatory. So particular attention has to be paid for the um, exploration of the liver and um, peritoneal surfaces to see if there's any carcinomatosis. And also uh, we have to check if um, adjacent organs are involved or not. This is um, a step that we have to do. Once the um, exploration and examination of the peritoneal cavity and uh, the nearby structures is completed, then we have to assess the retroperitoneal area. And this will help us to decide the fixity, the resectability of the tumor, and um, then we can we can go ahead with the next procedures. Um, can you hear me, Dr. Gulma? There is some rain, and uh, we can hear you. Uh, okay, okay, that's good. I'm afraid um, that the rain may be disturbing, and um, okay, I will continue if that is the case. There is no noise. It's good. That, that's okay. Thank you. So. Uh, after assessing the retroperitoneum, and um, we start mobilization. Uh, we have to elevate the mesentery and to um, uh, mobilize the colon, the right side of the colon. Uh, in comparison to the um, laparoscopic uh, mobilization, in open um, 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 mobilization of the right colon, we usually start from lateral to medial. Um, uh, uh, last week, probably uh, we have seen Doctor, um, the, we have seen um, the medial to lateral um, um, approach that uh, that is used in um, usually used in laparoscopic procedures. So, how do we proceed? The initial step, the first step should be for um, the technical is you have to grasp the cecum and lift it up and retract it medially, and this will lead to tenting of the peritoneal fold. That is um, um, how to easily start. So come along this area, along this fold of the peritoneum. You make um, uh, an incision. You divide this part. You can use um, cautery or a sharp incision is um, uh, possible as well. And um, you can start with this. And the traction, medial traction of the cecum will make it easy. This has to be followed by um, extension of the incision on the lateral border of the peritoneal fold as you see it on the um, um, next picture. So while doing this, um, we can um, use um, um, cauteries or we can um, incise this lateral peritoneal fold with a sharp um, incision. 
and um, a precaution is mandatory when you extend this. Uh, most important thing is that you have to try to remain in the uh, vascular plane and you should not breach the peritoneal cover, the cover of the um, retroperitoneal structures. If you do not um, respect this, then probably you will face with um, bleeding in the um, um, area and um, your plane will be dis um, um, disturbed. And uh, there is also a risk of injuring the um, retroperitoneal structures. It could be vascular structures, the ureter, and even if you go higher up, you can damage the gerotus fascia of the kidney, the lower part of the kidney, and so on can be damaged. So carefully, with um, good attention, we have to keep ourselves in the plane, go ahead, extend it, and then try to um, um, move to retract the part of the colon um, 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 medially. The next step once you have done this and um, made a traction towards the medial side is um, identifying um, and preserving retroperitoneal structures. As always mentioned, we have um, uh, important retroperitoneal structures, the um, 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 vascular structures, the um, um, ureter is there, and the kidney, the duodenum. Duodenum must always be identified and it should be kept away, um, pressing it down to the retroperitoneal area. The ureter can easily be identified, but um, if you have some difficulty, the best place to identify it would be on the, at the pelvic brim when it crosses the internal iliac artery, um, as it goes from lateral to a more medial uh, relation, then you'll be able to identify these um, structures. These are the structures which have to be um, identified very well and um, preserved very well. Once mobilization of um, this part of um, the area and, um, is done, then we have to um, 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 further extend the um, incision into um, the hepatic flexure. The hepatic flexure must be mobilized again and um, the extent on how far we have to mobilize and how long we have to go ahead uh, depends on um, um, the level of um, reduction and at the same time um, whether we are going to do omentectomy or not. If we are going to do omentectomy, if there is any involvement of the omentum and involvement of the nearby contagious structures, then we may need to do omentectomy and uh, we have to follow the steps of doing omentectomy uh, and go into the plane. This procedure, extending it far medially, will lead an opening of the um, lesser sac, will lead us to go into the lesser sac. So this is um, also, this also liberates the colon and uh, the specimen along with its colon can be medially, um, um, Old and medially tracted to give us um, another space. While doing so, we have to be very careful and um, undue retraction should be avoided. Extensive retraction should be avoided from the lateral to medial side. Otherwise, we can also have um, injury to some structures around here, the um, gastrocolic trunk and other vessels, gastrodotinal, pancreatic abdominal vessels, and um, um, we can have trouble some um, bleeding if um, 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 attention is not paid to this area. So avoid unnecessary force contraction. Otherwise, once we have done this um, space, we can go ahead with identifying um, the um, level of um, the ligation and resection of the um, arteries. At this stage, some techniques will help us to visualize the artery. You can take this um, specimen high up and uh, with the um, mesocolon completely visible, with the mesentery of the colon completely visible, particularly if you visualize it against light, it will show you the um, anatomy of the blood vessels clearly and you can decide as um, where you um, are going to um, um, ligate and then to reject. Then once the um, vessels are ligated, then we proceed with the mesocolic excision. You can cauterize and you can divide it. And this will um, 
finally take us to that level of transaction. The level of transaction proximally is about five to 10 centimeters of the anterior second valve. And this study how or where we reject depends on our extent of rejection. Um, so we have to decide whether it is um, um, an extended right hemicolectomy or the standard um, right hemicolectomy, and then we have to decide the site of rejection. Once this is done, along with the major colic excision, the specimen will have to be removed, and then we have to um, um, start fashioning our anastomosis, iliocolic anastomosis. Anastomosis uh, can be done using steps. This is the option that they use in the West study, but we don't have option. We use um, uh, hand sewn anastomosis using suture materials. And uh, this has to be fashioned if there is discrepancy between the ileum and um, the diameter of the colon. And um, you can use a dark layer um, anastomosis at this um, stage. And um, with this, the principles again should be readdressed. We have to utilize a well perfused bowel and we have to pay attention to the proper orientation of the uh, um, um, bowel segments of the bowel of the tube. So once this is done and um, anastomosis is completed, after um, a proper instrument count and um, peritoneal lavage, if there is a need, then we have to make a left closure of the abdomen and we have to plan the standard post-operative care and um, follow-ups of um, um, the patient. This is um, right colectomy. Left hemicolectomy will follow uh, more or less similar, but there are some differences that you will see. Again, considering the patient is well prepared and uh, put in the operating table, we keep these patients in a low lithotomic position in case we are going to do um, a low anastomosis and if we use some um, steps, we have to keep the patient in this position. And uh, the other reason is that we have to have a good access um, for the pelvic um, surgery. So incision, retraction, and exploration will be done in the same manner as we um, discussed for the right hemicolectomy. And uh, the first step in left hemicolectomy would be you have to identify the sigmoid colon. Sigmoid colon has to be identified and it has to be retracted medially. Frequently, we will get the sigmoid colon to be adherent to nearby structures or um, um, to its mesentery. There could be some adhesion and tethering. We have to uh, carefully liberate the sigmoid colon. We have to make it free so that we can lift it up to clearly visualize the line of told. Uh, unless we do this, um, it will be difficult to get the plane and um, it can also cause certain damage to um, uh, um, nearby structures like the ureter at the um, um, recess of the pelvic of the um, uh, sigmoid colon. So once we have identified the uh, sigmoid colon and retracted it laterally, make an incision on the line of told. This has to be extended laterally upwards, and then we have to um, expose the retroperitoneal area and identify, go into the retroperitoneal area and identify the structures again, like uh, what we did in the um, right hemicolectomy. In this case, we have to identify the ureter, the gonadal vessels, and there is no duodenum to identify on the left side, but we have also to have a look at the kidney and um, um, its, its structures. So following this, uh, the most important step is um, mobilization of the splenic flexure, and um, if there is a neat division of the inferior mesenteric vein. And this will give us some um, adequate length, particularly if our tumor is located high up and if our rejection will be more proximal, we need to have adequate lengths for a proper anastomosis low down in the pelvis. And um, unless and otherwise we do this procedure of um, um, uh, mobilization of the splenic flexure, it, would be, it will be difficult to have adequate and safe, um, adequate lengths to make a safe anastomosis. Mobilization of the splenic flexure is uh, somehow demanding and it would also be risky because of the, um, the location of the um, um, splenic flexure a little bit high and then more posterior closely attached to the retroperitoneal area so we have to be very careful 
and um, carefully clamping its um, um, suspensor ligaments and dividing this and then um, 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 a secure ligature of the area. Um, at times, if we are not very careful, if we apply unnecessary traction, it can be risky and it can be dangerous. It can strip the capsule of the spleen. It can, um, while we are applying this clamp, we can also cause injury to the, um, um, the tail of the pancreas. So these are the precautions that we um, have to make. And then with um, the necessary care, we have to mobilize it, divide it, and then mobilize further if there is a need. And this will liberate adequate lengths of um, um, the descending colon and the distal part of the transverse colon. As we did um, in the right side, then we will follow with the excision of the associate mesentery, ligate the vessels, depending on um, the level of the resection we want to have. And then finally, we are going to liberate um, the specimen and make um, a tension-free colocolic anastomosis following the basic principles that um, um, I have mentioned. So this is the case. And once we have done this, then we'll end up um, with some um, abdominal closure and um, the post-operative planning like what we did for um, the right side colectomies. So the other point I would like to mention um, and to describe is um, dealing with um, emergency cases. It is not uncommon that we face with emergency cases related to colon cancer, and uh, we have to be familiar with um, how to manage these cases. Um, in the literature, it's reported that uh, patients can present, about 15 to 30 percent of patients can present with um, any of the um, um, emergency conditions that are related to colon cancer. The commonest complication, the commonest emergency presentation is obstruction, uh, followed by perforation and bleeding is not very common. So we have to be familiar, particularly um, 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 senior residents and um, general surgeons when on duty, patients can have, uh, they can have patients with this uh, situation and we have to familiarize ourselves. So how do we manage this obstruction? is um, a condition that you will see mainly on the left side, but um, 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 at times it can also happen to the right side of um, um, colon cancer. And um, if we have a patient who is obstructed right or a transverse colon tumor, we have uh, two options. Um, uh, one option is we can rightly do right colectomy or extended right hemicolectomy depending on the location of the tumor and then do primary anastomosis. Uh, the other is defunctioning um, colostomy, defunctioning stoma or end colostomy. The choice of this between this depends on um, the status of the patient and the degree of um, um, dilatation of the proximal colon. So we have to individualize, but these are the two options. Left-sided colon cancers again, we have um, uh, two options of um, a single stage or two stage um, approach. Uh, again, this depends on the status of the patient. And um, in the single stage, we can do subtotal colectomy with ileocidmoid or ileolectal anastomosis. Um, the other option is segmental resection with colocolic anastomosis. Um, in the two stage procedure, uh, we have to do resection of the primary and uh, with um, proximal um, diversion um, um, of um, uh, for 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 vehicle diversion, and then this this these are the options. Again, these options depend on uh, the choice depends on um, the situation of the patient. Um, nowadays, there is um, a possibility of uh, stenting an obstructed tumor that we don't have in our setups again. But uh, this is also another um, option that is coming up. And if there is a possibility to make a stent, it has an advantage of um, converting the emergency condition into a more elective one that you can prepare your patient and do the resection properly in an elective fashion and um, optimizing your patient. Um, in um, high load um, areas, a success, clinical success rate of up to 80% has been reported, but uh, this is not without complication. Sometimes you can have complications about 6 to 7% of cases appearing with perforation, and um, then 
long-term outcome, oncologic outcome of this stenting is um, believed to be poor. So um, this is the condition. Perforation is um, a challenging condition and uh, the main challenge of um, the perforated tumor cancer, uh, colon cancers is patients usually will present with peritonitis and hemodynamic instability. So if this is the case, we have to have a goal and the main goal, goals are that we have to remove the disease segment and we have to prevent an ongoing peritoneal contamination. So whenever possible, whenever possible, if the patient can withstand the surgery, we have to do reduction, removal of the tumor, respecting the oncologic principles that we have been discussing. And following um, this procedure, we have to do proper peritoneal lavage. So the options depending again on the patient's condition are that we can do uh, proximal di diversion with um, a mucous fistula or Hartmann's procedure, or we can also do primary anastomosis, uh, either with proximal diversion or without uh, proximal diversion, depending on individual condition of the size, the proximal dilatation, the um, um, backlog of uh, fecal load of the patient, and most important on the uh, general status, hemodynamic status of the patient. So this is um, um, in case of perforation. Bleeding, as I have uh, mentioned, is um, a rare situation, a rare condition, particularly massive bleeding that requires surgery is not common, acute bleeding. Chronic bleeding can happen from um, right side um, colonic tumors, and this have to be treated in emergency condition. Uh, if you have an emergency bleeding, then uh, we have to try, if there is the facility, we have to try to stop the bleeding in, um, with um, non-operative, non-surgical modalities. Um, finally, the situation of metastatic colon cancer combination treatment has to be clearly understood with, um, by our residents and the general surgeons, and it's beyond the scope of this presentation. It's just to mention that um, metastatic colon cancer has its own approach, its own discipline on Detection and managing it. And we understand that um, colon cancers, malignancies have to be treated with combination treatment. And uh, we need to individualize, we need to understand how to select these patients and how to use a combination treatment, be it um, adjuvant or um, in neoadjuvant form. This is all what I have. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. We can proceed with um, comments and additional. Um, um, opinions from the other end and questions if there are any. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Mansour, for this outstanding presentation. And, you know, I can see how you really kept it nice and clear for our learners and particularly for the residents and uh, the junior, you know, faculty, be it general surgeons or those who are in surgery. So, so that said, I just want to give you an opportunity maybe to the, the Daniel Shiburu uh, to say a word or two um, in, you know, to complement this or also maybe cover partly or remind us the previous webinars, if you will. So, Danny, are you on the line? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Osman. That was a really good lecture. And uh, I, I think I, I totally agree with you. The most important thing is doing a good cancer operation, even in America, that's what, that's all what the patients care about. I think the laparoscopy and the robot stuff is nice for the surgeons, but what the patients really uh, want and care about is a, a proper oncologic resection. And, um, and and actually one, one of my comments is looking at your, some of your lectures. Um, why, why is the age um, so young in Ethiopia for colon cancer. I mean, we're seeing in, in, in America, uh, actually worldwide, uh, a decrease in the incidence of rectal cancer in the age group, uh, in the under 50 age group. But colon cancer still remains a disease confined to those, um, you know, more or less uh, over 60. And I was just curious, but, but I, I, I do understand though, the incidence of colon cancer, looking at the statistics in Egypt, is still very low. Uh, so maybe maybe that's right. But but I was just curious why why do you think is is the age, or could it be because of undiagnosed 
Lynch syndrome and other genetic diseases? Um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, Dr. Daniel, that is the, um, thank you very much for your um, comments and for sharing your ideas. Um, now, well, I think we have the observation that um, colon cancer is on the rise, although we don't have a concrete statistics. And also most of our patients, many of our patients um, appear to be younger. And um, um, in the Western world, there is a possibility of screening and um, to detect if there's any genetic um, um, attribution to the shift to the younger age, which is uh, confirmed in some um, areas. We are still at um, a younger stage to deal with this. And uh, the other possibility why we still have a low um, 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 record of colon cancer and um, as well as um, 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 that, that could be because of um, lack of screening, lack of um, um, diagnostic facilities. And um, as you understand, as you know, um, uh, there are also other socioeconomic factors that may contribute to um, the late presentation as well. So these are uh, my opinion. When the time comes and when we have a possibility of genetic screening and uh, we can also have a chance of um, finding out why our patients are having um, colon cancer at a younger age. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is a, a, an important question because it has a lot of implications mm -hmm. with regards to screening. As you know, here the screening starts at age 50 and um, if you have a polyp, a small one, you may end up getting another colonoscopy in three years, otherwise it goes every five years. So it has implication in that sense. And, and if it was here, this would be an academic pursuit for one of the young faculty members who could really take it to the next level by creating you know, a registry of um, you know, cancer, colon cancer in young patients across, you know, even if you open it up in three institutions, um, you know, Addis, Gondor, and, and Hawassa, you can have also a geographic, you know, um, variation and, and see what happens. But, you know, so, so there is a lot of questions um, that uh, I, I'm not sure if Daddy, if you have answered any one of them, but let me ask you here, the, one of the question is, can we take biopsy during emergency surgery for colonic cancer? I guess, you know, if you are doing an emergency surgery, you better take that colon out, right? So you, you can give them a big biopsy, but I don't know what that question exactly meant. Uh, what do you think about that? It says, can we do a biopsy during colonic surgery? Maybe liver biopsies? Danny, what do you do? Do you do? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming uh, during the surgery, if they see an additional tumor in the liver or in the peritoneum, uh, yeah, that's a reasonable thing to do. So the sec next question is, can we do oncologic resection on emergency case provided that the tumor is re resectable and the patient is stable? Yeah, um, yeah. I think um, I have mentioned that it depends on the patient's status. If the patient is stable, we have to stick to the oncology principles. As long as it's possible, if the patient is stable, we have to do um, oncologic reduction. As long as the situation allows and if it remains to be resectable, that is what we have to um, go for. So how about um, another one complicated with fistulas? For example, it says, hey, um, the gastrocolic fistula kind of thing that might be locally advanced, if you will, uh, but no other major metastatic sign. So how would you address that? Uh, if you have um, a locally advanced tumor, the oncologic principle is that you have to remove implants with um, um, the local invaded structure. So if you have a fistula, for example, usually what happens is a transverse colon tumor can make um, a fistula to the stomach or can have an invasion to the gastric wall. So you have to remove envelope along with part of this um, 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 tumor and then you have to liberate it. So if there is any involvement, a fistula or any contagious um, involvement of any structure, it has to go as M block and that has to be removed. Mm -hmm. I've just, yes, uh, I, mean, I agree. I will add to that. 
uh, somebody also asked, uh, how do you also do a synchronous uh, resection? So yes, even in an emergency situation, if you find the cancer to be resectable, you'll help the patient a great deal. If you can perform um, an oncologic resection, even if the situation is emergency, and that as long as the patient remains stable, that's the caveat, and uh, uh, removing part of the stomach, uh, um, in, you know, other organs like the spleen, um, it can have even done removing the left kidney uh, for a large bulky tumors. Uh, is is uh, yeah, it will it's you get a one good shot at we doing a proper kind of surgery. So. So you should, you should definitely go forth, uh, assuming the patient is stable and can withstand long surgeries uh, and so forth. And for synchronous cancers, which means cancers that are present at the same time, and this happens in the literature about three or 4% of the cases. So you have a tumor, let's say in the right colon, a cancer, and another one in the left. Uh, what do you do? Um, uh, you know, for, for these kind of situations, I, I usually go for total colectomy. Uh, and uh, so you can minimize the number of anastomoses and do an, a small bowel, the terminal ileum, to rectal anastomosis. Um, the, these patients have acceptable bowel function uh, long term uh, with good uh, disease free uh, survival. So don't be afraid to do uh, one big surgery with the ileo erectile anastomosis. And you can do this either with the stapler or hands on. So something that goes along uh, those lines. In, in Ethiopia, I would assume in most institutions, these uh, tumors are diagnosed preoperatively with biopsy and the colonoscopy, complete colonoscopy would have been done before going to the operating room. Is that a good assumption, Dr. Mensah? Yeah, yeah, that is um, the case in um, some centers. Some centers do not have um, a colonoscopy, but uh, what they do is they refer patients to an area where there is a colonoscope, but the big institutions, um, they do have it. And the colonoscopy is done, and we do um, uh, confirm the diagnosis, and we assess for a possibility of synchronous tumor. Yeah. How often does that happen? Is it more than 5%? Well, the literature um, uh, reports three to five percent of the yes. cases. That is most of the literature um, 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 that, that they recommend. But I've never yeah. faced one with the synchronous tumor so far in my practice. Okay. So, uh, so how about a, a, a hepatic nodule uh, that is present during your operation? So, so there's a question about resecting the nodules at the same time. Do you do that? And, um, you know, what dictates that if you didn't have a CT scan and you didn't see it, so small versus large, you know, what are your thoughts? Hmm. Well, um, um, yeah, okay, but Dr. Daniel, go ahead. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I think you now you're entering this very new uh, current topic about uh, oligo uh, metastatic cancers. Uh, um, so, so trying to do a metastatic resection at the same time, um, I don't advise it. Um, I mean, you can do it as a, for biopsy purposes, uh, but the ideal scenario is, um, at least this is an emergency case, to, re to really go unprepared. Uh, you know, you have staged the person, uh, and you know what the clinical stage of this person is ahead of time. Um, and, and if you think they have a resectable um, metastasis usually to the liver beforehand, you can do uh, con concurrent uh, liver resection and colon resection, assuming the patient can tolerate it. This is a really long operation. You can, they, they can be a lot of blood loss. Uh, otherwise, you can, it's, it's better to do these operations in staged fashions. Uh, in, the, in, in America and in most of the world, we recommend taking care of uh, doing chemotherapy first and resecting the metastasis, assuming it's resectable because this is what's gonna kill the patient. And then you come back uh, once they recover from this uh, to go out and to resect uh, the primary uh, colon cancer. Um, there are some surgeons who think in the setting of stage four, even if it's resectable, who believe 
um, we're saying the primary tumor uh, doesn't do much in terms of survival. So there's a lot of controversy here. So, so, so the, in, in short, to biopsy, you can do the remove the hepatic nodule. Otherwise, I don't recommend the at the same time. Yeah. So, so one other question is, you know, should we always do colostomy after a section of the colonic tumor, or is it has to be selected? I think Dr. Mansour clearly mentioned that it depends really on patient's condition, on the local condition, particularly what the colon looks like. If it is too dilated, you can't really do a safe anastomosis, you should defer. So it's really selective, but it, you know, you can definitely do a primary anastomosis, right? We can move on with that if, if need be? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And you don't really have to have always colostomies. Okay. Um, so I think the question of how do you approach unexpected metastatic disease, um, that piece is also, um, you know, something maybe you guys can comment. You know, metastatic disease usually is what? To the lymph nodes and to the liver, right? So, um, and uh, I think Danny summarized uh, the hepatic lesions. Maybe you want to really go back, stage it properly and do what you need to do, adding other neoadjuvant therapy to it or not and come back prepared is your advice. Mm -hmm. Paraphrasing you right. Correct, correct. Okay. And, uh, and then, you know, how about stents in colon cancer? Who is a candidate for stents and when do you put stents at all? I've just briefly mentioned about um, uh, stenting and these are indicated in cases of um, obstructive condition. They have uh, their own advantages and um, uh, the disadvantages I've just mentioned, the complications that can relate to. Uh, you can do this um, stenting in a patient who is not a good candidate to undergo immediate surgery and um, letting it stented will convert the um, emergency condition into an elective surgery that you can plan and prepare the, um, the procedure after optimizing. I don't have any experience. I don't think this is done also in our routinely. Maybe Dr. Daniel can supplement mm -hmm. if um, he has an experience on that. Yes, so generally for colon cancer, um, uh, stenting is ideal for tumors uh, distal to the middle colon artery. So any, anything proximal to that, you can't do it because the colon becomes more wider and the stents don't work. Um, so, uh, you know, so ideally, this the, the, the middle colon artery. So, so some people say, uh, the splenic flexure in distally uh, because that colon's caliber tends to be more narrow and this tends to work, tend, tend to work more. So what are the role of a stent? There are two roles for stent and, and, and one is as a bridge, as a bridge to palliation. So the patient has, has basically a, a hopeless disease and the stents can serve as a, a palliative purposes in terms of relieving obstruction and so forth. And the other one is as a bridge to treatment, uh, whether it be chemotherapy to shrink it and do the surgery or to decompress the colon. Uh, so you can resect after two days uh, without any problem with the um, mismatch in size, which increases your leak risk. So that's the role of the stain. One is to palliation and the other one is as a bridge to treating them with uh, uh, at the end of the day, of course, surgery is the main say of treatment as a, as a bridge to treatment, either chemo or variety surgery or straight to surgery. So I think uh, most of the questions have been answered here. And, uh, and uh, Danny, do you have any additional comments you want to make from the rectal perspective? If there's anything yeah. you thought about that you didn't cover last time, or maybe you can add here now. Yes, uh, I think uh, a couple of people asked about uh, uh, one question I, I saw here is this a very antiquated uh, thing about, you know, controlling the vascular pedicle uh, while doing cancer surgeries. This, is, this used to be the thing in the 80s and 90s. I remember reading about it. They call it the no touch technique uh, to prevent tumor spread that has been sort of debunked. So you, you, you do what you're comfortable with 
um, in the, the techniques are, as Dr. Mansour really highlighted in his lecture, you know, you stay in the proper planes, uh, try not to get into the mesentery of the colon, uh, which can increase local occurrence risks, uh, and really thoroughly mobilize the colon uh, and ligate the vascular supply to the, to the tumor uh, as high as possible. And, and margins of five centimeters above and below are adequate for colon cancer. Uh, so, so, but in your lab, in your, um, you know, robotic surgery the other day, mm -hmm. you were, you were talking about how you started up by, by the left colic. Um, yes. And so, vein. so that was not for the tumor surgery, it's just more for landmarking and having the right plane. Is that what it is then? Correct. Yeah. So for doing for, you know, deep pelvic anastomosis, like the ligation of the inferior mesenteric artery and vein really allows you for attention free anastomosis in the deep pelvis. Uh, no matter how well you mobilize, at least you divide these vessels high. So, so there's an oncologic benefit, of course, depending on the, the tumors, but for rectal cancer, it's largely for anastomosis. Because the number one reason why, why anastomosis leaks uh, happen is due to technique. And one of these technical difficulties is having tension on the anastomosis. So, so that, 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 that's why I do that, uh, in addition to getting in the right plane and so forth. So one just last question for both of you. In place where we don't know the site of a bleeding tumor, how do we proceed in the home? Mm, good question. So if there is no mass, then what does that mean? Is it a diverticula? Is it an angiodysplastic? dysplastic lesion that's bleeding. So I know here, most of the time, those kind of patients get actually an arteriogram uh, mm -hmm. and uh, to see where the bleeders are in that acute phase of bleeding. Uh, but short of that, I, I am not sure. Um, yeah. Many, many years ago, we, depending on, we had actually a number of units of blood that we decided on and, and we just go and do some selective clamping of the bowels and sometimes end up coming out with the whole bar receptor in the colon. So, so is there anything new going on uh, that you guys would recommend about bleeders that you don't know really what it's bleeding from? <clears throat> yeah, no, GI bleeding um, um, from um, unknown areas, you have said it should be diagnosed. The difficulty, the challenge for making the diagnosis is that also you cannot easily localize it on colonoscopy because of the situation in the um, colon. So under these circumstances, usually most of the bleeders will stop with conservative management. Hemodynamic um, support is what is required with blood transfusion and so on. But um, if the patient continues to be um, um, deteriorating, the option of um, um, pancolectomy is there and um, intraoperative localization would also be difficult. Maybe Dr. Daniel can supplement on that. Yes, I, mean, I think I totally agree with you, uh, Dr. Mansour. Yeah, that, that's a whole lecture about lower GI bleed workup, but for, for the residents and, and as a whole, uh, you know, you can, the, the, the first step in lower GI bleeding is uh, doing a digital anal rectal examination, maybe putting in a small scope, a rigid proctoscope or an anoscope, uh, that, uh, that can give you an answer usually because they can be coming from your hemorrhoids. Uh, but after that, even in, in, you know, in developed countries like America, we have a very difficult time localizing them. You can, uh, uh, but but for, for sort of book purposes, you can start doing uh, an RBC scan for low bleeders. Um, this, this kind of gives you an idea of the, whether the patient is actively bleeding or not. For active bleeders, as Dr. Germa mentioned, you can do an arteriogram. Um, and the other one is, of course, a colonoscopy. The colonoscopy is nice because in, by doing a colonoscopy, you can be lucky in localizing the bleeder, but at least you can rule out that the bleeding is not coming from something more serious, like a malignancy. Uh, but by and large, a lot of these bleeders tend to stop. If they don't stop and the patient keeps deteriorating, then the treatment option is total colectomy. Uh, which carries a, a fairly high mortality rate in some of these patients. 
Well, this is um, really has been a wonderful two weeks and I hope uh, everyone um, back in Ethiopia has enjoyed the discussions and, uh, and the topics covered. You know, we can really never have enough time to, you know, conclusively go over everything we want to go over, but uh, it is really important for us to hear your opinion on the survey that has been sent and it's going to be sent again one more time probably for the last time today or tomorrow so that we know what your um, needs are going to be and um, and we try to actually figure out some topics that can overlap a little bit the different specialties and i just want to mention also plug in here that next week we are going to start on monday with the infectious disease related uh, topics. And this is not going to be only for internists or ID people, but it's really something that can serve a purpose to everyone. For example, surgical infections are very common in Ethiopia. And, you know, in some places, you know, they are maybe 20%, 30%. So there are some basic uh, understanding that we all have to get uh, from antimicrobial resistance. And all surgeons and internists and everybody actually needs to know and understand about infection control. So we want to start um, with, with a, on the title of you know, antimicrobial resistance and the basic understanding, how do you do, how do you calculate it? How do you study in your hospital and your environment um, uh, antibiograms and really understand which bacteria are the problem so that your treatment uh, is going to be targeted. And so, so this applies there for, for a patient that may have a pneumonia versus a patient that may have just a regular post-operative infection. So I invite everybody to attend and uh, we're going to go dive into different aspects of the infection, including some, um, you know, um, um, uh, fungal infections as well, which are also at times really of interest. And, uh, and so we will send the complete program for the next two weeks uh, over the weekend. And following that, we want to tackle some topics in endocrinology. So including, you know, uh, again, things like thyroid and parathyroid uh, and um, diabetes. So all these are, um, topics that are really important for everybody. Uh, I don't care if you are a pediatrician or an internist or a surgeon, but I think everybody should know um, about parathyroidism and about thyroids in, in general. So, you know, stay tuned. And uh, I really want to appreciate, uh, you know, Daniel, uh, who has been working hard on getting this uh, seminar together the last two weeks. I really appreciate Dr. Mansour for um, you know, doing your talk today and, you know, it means a lot to us. Uh, we really want to hear the voices and also elevate the educators like you who are in Ethiopia so that this can be a joint effort and uh, we'll be continuing to reach out to the others as well. And I know Dr. Antone is not on the call, but I want to also send my appreciations to him. So with that, you know, have a, a great afternoon wherever you are and uh, a great start of the day over here for us. So. We'll see you next week.